Hello and Assalamu Alaikum. I am Kashif Kamran. A very warm welcome to the Advance Audit and Assurance Webinar to Success for Exams in June 2022. Today is the day five, the final day of the webinar. Now, the focus of the fifth and final day of the webinar is on reinforcement of the core areas. We were discussing the same agenda yesterday on day four, and that same agenda gets to the day five with further reinforcement of the core areas which were left unattended on the day four yesterday because uh, we almost took time on the reporting area yesterday. So we were left with certain areas unattended which will be carry forward to the day five today and we'll be spending the last and the final day of the webinar on those particular syllabus areas, which is basically the syllabus area E. And we know one of the question in section B has to be from syllabus area E. So the better you understand the day four and day five will be benefiting you at least with one question in the section B of the paper. So let's start. Uh, the proceedings for the day five, the final day of the webinar to success for advanced audit and assurance. Now, the agenda is to look at three things which were left unattended on day four. Number one, going concern. Number two, matters to be communicated to those charged with governance. And number three, audit evidence. And we know uh, these three topics in front of your screen uh, are a very regular feature of the paper, particularly the audit evidence. And we have seen that whenever the examiner give you a question on going concern uh, in the section B, uh, it's, it's on average for 15 to 16 marks, not less than that. So a lot of things are asked by the examiner when a question on going concern is put in. So you should be prepared for that. Let's, let's open the agenda and let's go down into the area of going concern first and let's prepare ourselves for the going concern area. Now, first of all, uh, what a question on going concern expect from a student and are you meeting that expectation is very important. So we need to look inside the expectation of the examiner and the examiner report exactly that what a question expects from a student and are you literally meeting that expectation or not? Number two, what student do wrong in a going concern question? Uh, we were even discussing some implication on the audit report yesterday that what are implications on the audit report of a going concern? And I will be reinforcing them again today. Number three, the implication for the audit report uh, relating to a going concern issue. And number four, the marking scheme. Now, there is a bit of difference in the marking scheme of a reporting question, a marking scheme of a going concern question, because yesterday uh, when we were discussing the reporting area, the marking scheme of a reporting area is one mark per valid point. So you have a flat marking scheme for reporting area which is one mark. Let's see, is, is that the case with going concern or we have a bit of different looking marking scheme for a going concern area? Uh, let's open the discussion. There is one recommended article. Uh, you will get that in the resources for day five when it gets uploaded on the Google Drive, but this is the hyperlink and this is an article on going concern. So examining, examining team has written an article on going concern and you can read this article and you can get very good knowledge of the subject matter, which is basically going concern. So that's a recommendable article. The past papers, two of them, December 18, question number two, and December 15, question number two B. So these are recent papers where going concern question has come in. And you should know exactly what the question expects from you. I will be taking the December 18 into context. Uh, we'll go over it, understand it, look at the examiner comment because December 15 and December 18 have similar requirements. So the requirement of a reporting question, uh, even the old reporting, uh, old going concern question, sorry, uh, which has come on going concern uh, in I think 2013 or 2014, 
have the similar requirements. So the requirements of a going concern question never changes. It's just about understanding them. So let's, let's open the journey and let's start looking at my word file for the day five, which must now be in front of your screen. We're looking at the reinforcement of the core areas part two, and we are starting first with going concern exam context. I hope you can see this word file on your screen, right? So that's the first area we're starting today with. Okay, let's start looking at going concern. We are taking a look at the December 18 paper exactly to understand what the question asks from a student. And that's exactly the requirement in any reporting question. You will never find a different looking requirement uh, in another going concern question. That's exactly the same one. So let's take an analysis of the December 18 paper and the marking scheme because that's the latest one we have currently. So let me open the December 18 paper for you. Just give me one minute. I hope you can see the December 18 paper in front of your screen. If yes, please con confirm that. Can you see the PDF uh, version of the paper? I, I'm not currently going on the practice platform because they just need to understand the requirements you are encouraged to do the questions on the practice platform. Okay, thank you so much for confirming that. We'll go down the December 18 paper and we go to the question number two. I hope you can see the question number two now in front of your screen, which is about Delhi company. And Delhi company is a family owned unlisted company. So it's a family owned unlisted company, right? That's the question we are looking for. Now, examiner, uh, Let's see what the examiner has asked for and then come back to the case study. You go down, you look, you are looking at a lot of numbers in the going concern question. And then you go down, 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 you see the PNL as well. So good amount of numbers given to you. And then you have some note numbers, note number one, two, three, four, five, six, which are basically the assumptions about the foreseeable future. Let's look at the requirement. And these are common requirements you find in every going concern question. There are three requirements, A, B, C, and we'll spend time on each one of them. The first requirement, A and B, let me copy that from here. And let me take this to my Word file. And then we have another requirement, the C requirement, uh, which is down right here. Let's take that as well to my support file down here so we have three requirements abc from a question december 18 uh, part december 18 question two sorry okay let me just give me one second so i can just arrange this question and we can start to discuss what exactly this question is asking you and what to expect okay now i hope you can see the question in front of your screen let's do an analysis the first requirement using analytical review where appropriate so examiner wants you to use analytical review you you do find this uh, situation in the question number one as well at times when you are uh, evaluating the audit risk or at times you are evaluating uh, the risk of material misstatement uh, examiner do ask you to use the analytical review or use the analytical procedures in the question number one. I think particularly it was in the September 18 question number one, which has already been addressed in the previous webinar. But this is this is not the first time you're looking at the examiner asking you to do the analytical review. So using analytical review where appropriate. Now this is very important. Where appropriate. Now where appropriate means you cannot do it forcefully. I hope you agree with me. Where appropriate means where possible. Where appropriate means where possible, right? Now, where possible means not doing it where it's not possible because student starts to do it forcefully, which is wrong. So first of all, examiner is saying you need, you need to do the analytical review where possible, number one. So analytical use analytical Tickle review, but the important thing is where possible, number one, right? 
then you see a comma and after the comma the requirement continues comma evaluate the methods which may cast doubt on the ability of the company to continue as a going concern so you need to evaluate the matters which matters which matters not the matters we were discussing yesterday in a reporting question not a matter relating to materiality not a matter relating to an accounting treatment not a matter relating to the under and over statement but matters which may cast doubt on the ability to continue as a going concern so which matters the going concern matters so matters which may cast doubt so do you believe this these matters will be given in the case study do can we have a rote learn list of this can we have a rote learn list of which may cast doubt no but we have to look into the case study right because the case study will guide us exactly which matters may cast doubt on the company's ability to continue as a going concern so in the second case what are we doing we need to evaluate and i hope you know that whenever you are evaluating something evaluate means to give a conclusion evaluate what matters which may cast doubt on the going concern of the given company is that clear so every time you look at this word evaluate what you need to do evaluate means to give a conclusion at the end of part a answer at the end of the part a answer right i hope i've guided you about that in my day 2 and day 3 as well so there are two requirements here one is to use and one is to evaluate i hope you're clear with that right now look at the marking scheme the marking scheme of this question is very interesting now we know every time the examiner ask you to evaluate a going concern meta let's let's confirm the marking scheme and that will remain the same for every going concern question you do okay can can you see uh, the marking scheme on your screen now please confirm that can you see the marking scheme on your screen for this going concern question right okay i'm just copying the marking scheme here control c right here and i take this marking scheme back to my support file and this is the marking scheme and let's see what the examiner is telling us in the marking scheme for any question on going concern now the marking scheme is pretty simple examiner is saying that you will get two marks for a well explained going concern indicator so up to two marks for each well explained indicator so evaluate the matters which may cast doubt so each matter will give us how many marks two each matter evaluated is equal to two marks now we have seen in the past paper that some of the going concern question do not ask you to use the analytical review uh, i think in the december 15 paper in the december 15 paper the question was direct evaluate the matters which may cast doubt on the company full stop and you had like 10 marks so you straight away divide 10 with 2 so how many going concern matters you will be writing in the answer how many going concern matters will you be writing in the answer 10 divided by 2 5 but over here in this question we just we 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 don't have only the methods we also have an analytical review so examiner is saying use the analytical review so examiner will give us certain number of marks for using so let's see what is a mark for using analytical review up to 3 marks for the calculation for the calculation number 1 of the relevant ratios so if you calculate the relevant ratios or you calculate the relevant trends increase or decrease you will fetch up to 3 marks so how many maximum marks we have for evaluation up to 3 marks now listen to me very carefully analytical review up to 3 marks for ratios or for trends whatever up to 3 now for example one student only 
calculated one ratio in the whole answer. So the number of marks you're getting for that is one, right? And the remainder number of marks are nine. So out of the 10 marks, you calculated one ratio. So how many marks are you left with? Nine, right? So nine divided by two. How many metres will you be writing? Roughly five, right? Roughly five. Four and a half, right? Four and a half means five. Not four. Four is like eight, right? It's better to write five because the marks are nine. Okay. If one student calculate two ratios, now 10 minus two is eight. And then you divide eight by four. So how many metres will that student be writing? four so the number of marks you have for ratios is three now if one student utilize the entire three marks on ratios how many marks are you left with 10 minus three seven so seven divided by two how many uh, metres will you be writing seven divided by two not three and a half rather four so are you getting the marking scheme? So you have in total 10 marks, right? So from the 10 marks, the maximum number of marks you can deduct for ratios is three. So if one student do all three ratios, you deduct 10 minus three. If one student do two ratios, 10 minus two. If one student do one ratio, then 10 minus one. And the remaining marks are to be divided by two. Are you clear with it? So let's understand this, right? After the marking scheme, now understand this critically, right? Because the other parts are pretty simple. Now listen to me very carefully. <clears throat> For example, the student one calculated one ratio, so that means 10 minus 1 is equal to 9 marks. And 9 marks divided by 2 is equal to 5 meters. I hope you're getting this, what I'm saying, right? Student 2 calculated 3 ratios. So that means 10 minus 3 is equal to 7 marks. 7 marks divided by two is equal to three and a half. So four meters. So a student one is calculating one ratio and writing five meters. And a student two is calculating three ratios and writing four meters. Are you getting this? Right, so can, can we do anything? Can, we, can, can you be a student one or can you be a student three? It's up to you, right? Two or one, sorry. So this is how you can understand the marking scheme, right? Now, let's see, is that so simple? Because it's, it's not that simple what you're trying to understand currently. Now, if you just calculate a ratio, you will get one mark. For example, you calculate the receivable collection period. You get one mark, right? But you need to utilize it. You need to utilize it. You need to convert that receivable collection period into a matter which may cast doubt. So if you calculate a ratio and you calculate that ratio into a matter which may cast doubt, how many marks will you get for it? If you calculate a ratio and you convert that ratio into a matter which may cast doubt, how many marks are you fetching in total? Who is a clever student? If you calculate a receivable collection period and you convert the receivable collection period as a matter which may cast out, how many marks will you get for it? Three. Very good answer, Abhishek, Jen, Salia. Three. Because one mark is for calculating the ratio and two marks is for converting it into a matter which may cast out. Three. So if you are a clever student, you calculate one ratio and you convert that ratio into a matter which may cast out. So you're taking three marks, right? You calculate three ratios and you convert them to matters which may cast out. So three multiplied by three becomes nine. 
and you write an extra meter and you wind up the answer. Are you getting this point, everyone? So each ratio will give you one mark plus two marks for commenting on the matter which we cast out. Let, let's demonstrate one of them for your sake of understanding. Okay, just let's take one, one example and write it. Okay, one suggested answer. What suggested answer, right? Just, just one of them. You go back to the case study, right? Uh, we had the case study where? Okay, you had the case study here, right? Okay, let's go to the case study. Uh, okay, we have... Uh, okay, can, can you see the trade receivables of the company here? Trade receivable of the company here, right? Can you all see that? For 2008 and for 2007. Okay. Now, just note the numbers with you. The, the receivable for the last year is 2.6. The receivable for the current year is 3.7. Have you noted it down? Because I will be asking the answers from you. The receivable for the current year is, uh, just give me one second. Okay. The, the receivable for the last year is 2.6. And for the current year, it's 3.7. Right? Okay. That is it. Now you go down and you look at the sales because you need to find the receivable collection period. Okay, what's the sales? The sales in 20X7 is uh, 8.8 .8 million and in 20X8 is 11.3 million. So you have sales, right? So sales is 8.8 .8 in the last year and the sales is 11.3 in the current year. Now, can you just take few seconds and find the answer for me for the receivable collection period of the current year and the prior year. Has anyone found the answer for the receivable collection period for the current last year and the current year? Okay, eighty-four days. Uh, Salia is the current is the last year. Eighty-four is the last year. Okay, 107 days last year. And what about this year? Just, just, just getting some confused answers from all of you. Uh, just, just let me confirm myself. 119 this year. Okay, that seems better. Can anyone reconfirm, please? Uh, or should I calculate my own answer? Because I'm getting very distorted answers. 2.6 divided by 8.8 .8 into 365. Okay, 108, right? 108 days is in the last year. 108 days is in the last year. And like 119 is in this year. That's what, what one of the students is saying. 3.7 divided by 11.3 into 365. Yes, that's perfectly good answer. 119.5. So I'm just taking it 120 rounding off, right? So the right answers are 108 and 120. That's a very close cost, uh, cost tense, right? So that's good. So has the receivable days increased? So if, if I just take it back to my Word file, see how I get marks. I write the heading receivable, receivable collection period. An examiner is saying calculation up to three marks for calculation, right? Calculation. So I say receivable collection period, and under that, I write my answer. I first tell examiner that the receivable collection period has increased from 108 days in 20 
x7 to 120 days in 20x8 full stop. Now, the receivable collection period has increased from 108 days. I calculated the 108 days, right? To 120 days, I calculated that. So for calculation, I straight away get one mark, full stop, calculation, right? This is calculation. If you want to show the working, show it. It's a waste of time in exam paper. You can directly find the answer on a calculator and put it in your word processor. Save your time. So directly find the answer and put it in the word processor, just like I am doing currently, right? So the receivable collection period has increased. Full stop, one mark. Now, is, is the increase a matter which may cast out? You put a full stop and you say, because the collection period has increased, this demonstrate that the customers might be struggling to pay on time or is taking a greater time to pay. This can affect the overall working capital of the company. This can affect the overall working capital of the company and can cause liquidity and it can cause liquidity issues to the company if collection is not made on time. So you're taking greater time to collect and collect means cash inflows. So it can cause the liquidity issues to the company if collection is not made on time as this will affect the cash inflows. Now we know liquidity is an indicator of a going concern, right? Which can, which will affect the cash inflows. Thus, this matter can, this matter along with other matters, along with other liquidity matters, there might be many more in the case study, right? This matter along with other liquidity matters in the case can cast doubt on the company's going concern. Because liquidity is a real, real concern, right? Liquidity is the lifeline of the business. Now see, have I done a commentary on this increase? Have I tried to convert this to a matter which may cast out? Look at this. How many extra marks will I get for this? No, marker is not interested in the working. Marker is interested in the answer. So how many marks will I get here? Two. So have I converted the matter into, uh, have I converted the calculation into a matter which may cast out? Are you understanding the marking scheme now? Is everyone understanding the marking scheme? Good. So a ratio calculated in isolation is just one mark, useless, useless. Till the time the ratio is translated into a matter which may cast out to maximize marks. This is the same issue you have in a risk question. Question number one. In a question number one, if the examiner asks you to do the analytical procedures, you get one mark for a ratio, same, same, one mark for a ratio, even in question number one, if asked for. But if you convert the result of the ratio in question number one into a risk, into a risk of material misstatement, you will get further two marks for it. So that's, that's the same equation there. So a ratio in isolation is useless, right? Till the time that ratio is translated into a certain parameter. I hope you're getting the point here, right? Okay, can, can we see the uh, criticism of the examiner for the first part and move on to the next question? Are you clear with the marking scheme? Are you clear with the structure of the question? So you need to find the matters which may cast doubt, right? And there are so many matters given in this question. 
uh, there is so much numerical information. You can you can find the ratios from the numerical information, right? And the examiner has not just given you the numerical information. Examiner has also given you so much narrative information. See these note numbers. Examiner has given you the note numbers. You can just read through the note numbers and you can find that why a note number is a matter which may cast out. So you have plenty of information just for a 10 marks answer. Right, for example, look at this one. A major new competitor has moved into the Delhi company market in 20x8. If a major new competitor has moved into the market where you are operating, is it a threat to your market share? Can it encroach your sales? Can your sales goes down? Can your customer switch to the new competitor? So is it is it a threat? And is is a threat is a threat a matter which may cast doubt on the going concern status? So see, you can convert this into a matter which may cast doubt for two marks. So you need to pick up the information from the case, right? And convert that into a matter which may cast doubt. Just as let's look at the examiner criticism for December 18. Can you see the examiner report for December 18 on your screen now? Please confirm. Can you see the examiner report? Okay, great. Let's go to the question number two. And let's see what is the criticism of the question number two, which we were looking for. Okay, I hope you can see the question number two now on your screen for the criticism part, which is the going concern question. Okay, let's see what is the examiner telling us. Requirement A for 10 marks. That's what we are looking for currently. Now I'm reading and I'll stop and we'll discuss. Requirement A for 10 marks uh, asks candidates to evaluate the matters which may cast doubt on a client's ability to continue as a going concern. Candidates were directed to analytical review of a cash flow forecast to aid in their evaluation. And those who used a quality quantitative and discuss discursive part of the scenario to describe the going concern risk indicators with an explanation of how that impacted on the company's future tended to score good marks. Candidates who merely calculated ratios, who merely calculated ratios and stated the direction of the movement or simply stated that an increase in a receivable collection period showed a going concern issue attained few marks. Did I, did I wrote that way? I, I first found the increase to get my one mark then I converted the increase into a matter which may cast out, right? So examiner is saying candidates who merely calculated ratios and stated the direction of the movement or simply stated that an increase in the receivable collection period showed going concern issue attained few marks. No, you cannot just say the receivable collection period has increased. Thus, it's a going concern indicator for a stop and expect examiner gives you three marks or two marks. No. It is important candidates demonstrate their knowledge of how each matter gave rise to an issue for trading as a going concern. For example, a fuller explanation would be that an increase in the receivable collection period may mean that the irrecoverable debts which should be written off increase losses further. That's another point of view. I, I took the liquidity point of view, right? The examiner is taking another point of view. Examiner is saying if there are irrecoverable debts, because of the receivable collection period rising, it will increase the losses further. And if the losses increases, that's an indicator of a going concern too. So examiner is giving you another indicator. So you need to link the ratio with an indicator of a going concern, either my answer or this answer. But that's what the examiner is telling you. I hope you're getting the criticism well of the examiner here. Or that shows that the collection would decrease the liquidity. So your collection would decrease the liquidity and therefore put pressure on the company's ability to make payments. So examiner is taking my perspective as well, the liquidity perspective. So either it's a liquidity problem or it's the losses problem, right? So a technique a candidate could employ here would be to ask themselves why as they get to the end of the sentence. So if you say receivable collection period has increased full stop, why? What's the issue? 
A minority of candidates appear to lack focus on the question requirement and answered this as a ROM discussion covering risk of material misstatement in the forecast rather than relating it to the scenario of the going concern. Again, you cannot do something, you cannot do anything about students like such converting a going concern question into a ROM question. Are you clear with the criticism? So are we sure what to do? We need to develop a point, right? We need to develop a point uh, into a matter which may cast out merely calculating ratios with an increase or decrease is useless. I hope you're all sound with this, right? Let's move on to the next requirement. Requirement number. B. Now that's an evidence requirement. <clears throat> Explain the evidence. Now, this is quite a common question, right? We still have an evidence uh, session today as well. I will be covering evidence. Uh, so it says evidence, not procedures, in respect of the cash flow forecast, which would expect to find in your review of the working papers. So examiner is asking you, what evidence will you find in the working paper file for a cash flow forecast? As simple as that. So what is the question asking? What evidence would you expect to find in the working papers for what? For the cash flow forecast. <clears throat> what evidence? How many marks you have? Nine marks divided by one mark per evidence. You know that the marking scheme for evidence or the marking scheme for a procedure, the marking scheme for an action is one mark. So nine marks, one mark per evidence. So how many evidences are you writing? Nine evidences in the working papers. And you know how you write evidences, right? Uh, the procedures start with an action, review, analyze, discuss, right? But when you're writing a proceed, uh, when you're writing an evidence, the evidence starts with evidence starts with a working paper like what? Uh, a copy of uh, notes of results of right? That's, that's, that's how you start writing a working paper, a copy of something, a notes of something, results of something, and you write the sentence. So when you're writing a procedure, a procedure start with what? A procedure start with action, review something, analyze something, discuss something, recalculate something. But when you are writing an evidence in the working paper file, the evidence in the working paper file is documentary. So a documentary evidence in the working paper file means either it's a copy of something, it's the notes of something, or it's the results of something, right? So that's, that's how you write the uh, evidence in the working paper file. So in the working paper file, the evidence will be in the form of paper, right? Paper. So this is my evidence, evidence in the working paper file. So either this is a copy of something or this is notes, which I've written notes or either on this paper are the results. If I've done a recalculation, I have the results of recalculation on this paper. So the working papers, right? The working papers, something tangible, something hard copy, something going in your file. So imagine a working paper, right? So you can write the working paper in the exam context realistically. I hope you're clear with it. So evidence, right? Now, examiner has given you the cash flow forecast in the question paper. Uh, let me show you that. Uh, just one minute. I hope you can see right over here. This. Can you see this paragraph which I've just highlighted? This is about the cash flow forecast. Can you just read it out in like few seconds? I'm just uh, holding myself for one a few seconds. Can you just read this yellow paragraph?
right? So this is the para which is given by the examiner, a very short paragraph on, going cons on, on the cash flow forecast. An examiner wants you to convert this to nine evidences in the working paper file. Let me give you a clue and you do the rest yourself. You bring this paragraph on the word file. I hope you can see this paragraph on the word file now in front of your screen. Please confirm that. And you just need to convert this to evidences in the working paper file. So I just bring this para here, the note five from December 18, question two B. Question two, sorry. Can you all see this? Uh, can we convert this to like uh, evidences? Okay. Evidence in the working paper file, right? Direct. So I just put the heading evidence in working paper file and I start writing the answer. Number one, the going concern working paper includes a cash flow forecast for the 12 months ending 31st of August 2009. So already, already your working paper includes a cash flow forecast. So if I say a copy of a cash flow forecast, that will be wrong because the working paper include. So it's already there. It's already there. So a cash flow forecast is already in my working paper. Full stop. Now let's see what further I can have for my cash flow forecast. The cash flow forecast assume. Assume is an assumption. And I should have a working paper for an assumption. Assume that the Dali company revenue will increase by 25% next year. So the company is assuming that the Dali company revenue will increase by 25% next year. So while I, I was auditing the cash flow forecast as an auditor, would I have discussed this matter with the management? Would I have discussed the basis with the management that what are the basis uh, that you expect that the revenue will rise by 25%? Or I must have uh, checked the sales forecast as a document. So do you believe an increase of 25% would have been discussed with the management for the underlying basis? And would you believe I would have seen the cash, uh, I would have seen the sales forecast as an evidence that what are, what are basis of 25% increase? So in, in my working paper file, what support will I have? What support will I have? If, if, uh, if, you, if I'm a manager and I'm looking at the file of my junior, and I want to see what the junior has done on an assumption that the revenue will increase by 25%. What have you done on the assumption that the revenue will increase by 25%? Number one, I would have notes of discussion with the sales director or the finance director confirming the underlying assumptions taken, uh, underlying assumptions taken for a forecasted increase in revenue by 25%. So I must have had a discussion with them, right? Asking them what are underlying reasons of increase. Now, discussion is a procedure. I, I, I'm not writing a procedure. I'm writing a evidence. So evidence becomes notes, notes of discussion. Then second, I will have a copy of the sales forecast because sales forecast is an underlying document in which you forecast the revenue. Copy of the sales forecast to confirm the assumptions taken uh, to assumptions taken to support the 25% increase in revenue in next 12 months. What assumptions has the management taken uh, in the sales forecast when they are predicting that the sales will increase by 25% in the next month? Next, notes of discussion. Sorry, just one minute. Notes of discussion with management confirming how 25% increase is possible considering 
uh, and considering a new competitor, considering a new competitor has entered into the market. So I would have a discussion with them, asking them, how would you justify that your sales will increase by 25% considering a new competitor has entered the market and has this been evaluated in the projected, has this been evaluated in the forecasted increase? Yes, notes of discussion is basically the notes the auditor is taking, right? So if I'm discussing with the management, uh, I, I'll just take my notes, right? So if I'm discussing with management, Mustafa, I'm taking my notes. So notes is basically the notings, notings of the auditor, right? Uh, while the auditor is having a discussion. Like if I'm conducting a lecture, a student is taking a notes. So that becomes the lecture notes basically, right? So in the same way, when I'm having a Q&A session with the management, so I keep my paper with me and I keep noting things management is telling me and that becomes my notes of discussion. I hope you're clear with that, right? So is everyone clear how to go about it? So are you clear with this uh, discussion? Will you move on to the evidence part? So evidence is not a procedure, right? Uh, evidence has to start with a working paper. A procedure has to start with an action. I hope you're technically sound between a procedure and a evidence. So see, I started my evidence with notes or copy or notes, etc. Just putting that in my working paper file. So revenue will increase by 25%. I should have uh, evidence for that. And the reorganization of its credit control facility. So you should have evidence for the reorganization of the credit control facility number two. Customer will pay on average after 60 days. I will have some evidence for this. The forecast also assume that the bank will provide a new finance. Assume that the bank will provide a new finance. I should have something for this. And the company will have a positive cash balance of 1.7. And the company will have a positive cash balance of 1.7. I should have something for this. So all yellow highlighted points needs to be converted into evidence. So I, I hope you remember my mnemonic for uh, procedure. What was my mnemonic for procedure? Anyone remembers? No, 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 not, not the TADMSR. Uh, the CASP, CASP, right? So if, if we need to make a mnemonic for evidence, what will that be? Evidence has to be case specific, no doubt about it. I, I just took this from the case, right? Will increase by 25%, right? So I took this from the case and I converted that to evidence. Case specific, no doubt about that, right? Next, action, no, no not, not action. A working paper, a working paper, a working paper. Case specific, a working paper, notes. Subject matter, S and P purpose, same. Look at this, my evidence one, two, three, are they from the case, out of case, tell me. The evidence on your screen, one, two, three, are they from case, out of case? Case, right? They are from case. Do they have a working paper? Look at this working paper. What is working paper means? Let me color that. Working paper means yellow. Notes, yellow. Copy, yellow. Notes, yellow. What is the subject matter? The subject matter is notes of what? Notes of what? So the subject matter is notes of discussion with director. That, that becomes the subject matter. Blue, the blue becomes the subject matter. Notes of what? Copy of what? Copy of the sales forecast. So that becomes a subject matter. Notes of discussion with management. Discussion with management becomes my subject matter. Blue. What is the purpose? So notes of discussion with the finance director to confirm. Confirm is the purpose. Confirm is the purpose. Green. Confirm is the purpose. Copy of the sales forecast to confirm. Confirm is the purpose. Notes of discussion confirming. Green. 
So can you see the three colors, yellow, blue, green, paper, matter, paper, subject matter, purpose. And they're all taken from the case. They're all taken from the case. Yes, the working papers of the auditor, right? Not working paper used by auditor, working paper of the auditor. Because whenever the auditor is performing a procedure, a procedure converts to an evidence logically. So if, if I recalculate the depreciation expense, Mustafa, if I recalculate the depreciation expense, that is a procedure, right? But what is the evidence that I recalculated the depreciation expense? The results, the results of recalculation. So I, I will put my results on a paper, right? Results of recalculation. These are results of recalculation, right? Notes of results or results of recalculation, right? So a procedure translates to an evidence. But examiner is not asking you to write a procedure. Examiner is asking you to write an evidence. So are you clear with the mnemonic of evidence? What will that be? C, W, S, P. C, W, S, P. Working paper. Not C, A, S, P. W. So what's the difference? The only difference is, the only difference is what? The only difference is W. Otherwise, it's the same. So a procedure is CASP. The evidence is CWSP. I hope you're clear. So that's, that's evidence basically, right? I hope you take this as an important note, student note. Is that clear? Will that benefit you somehow? Right, so we'll have a further more discussion on evidence shortly, but that was in context of the going concern. Examiner is asking you to write evidence on a cash flow forecast. The cash flow forecast was given in the note number five. So you utilize the cash flow forecast here and you converted them to three evidences. You need to make a total of nine evidences from the working paper file. Okay, you move to the last requirement, C. Explain the possible reason why the directors may wish to exclude the disclosure. Why would the director exclude the disclosure of a material uncertainty from the notes? And evaluate the possible implication for the audit report. Now, two things has been asked for. Number one, why the directors why the directors may exclude disclosure. Disclosure of what? Disclosure of material uncertainty relating to going concern. Why would the director exclude a disclosure of material uncertainty relating to going concern? Why? And second, evaluate the implication for auditor report. Now you must be fresh from day four yesterday, implication for the audit report. Now first tell me, why would the auditor exclude a disclosure? Sorry, why would the director exclude a disclosure? Why? Why would they not give a disclosure of MURGC? Why? Firstly, why? Are, are they negotiating a loan with the bank? Are they uh, negotiating a loan with the bank? So is, is that one of the reasons they would not give it because they don't want uh, a bad picture to go to the bank, right? So is, is that one of the reasons they're negotiating a loan with the bank? Right, are you getting my point everyone? Waiting for your answers to move on. Let me show you the marking scheme of this question. Evidence is one mark. See, the examiner has given you so many evidences here, right? You can just scroll down here in the marking scheme and see uh, the evidence you wrote match with the examiner. Examiner has given you more than nine, right? You need to write nine. Reasons for non-disclosure. One mark for each reason and one mark for the reporting area, right? Possible reasons. Examiner has given us possible reasons. He's Desire uh, to present companies a pos uh, in positive light to investor and third parties. Yes, that's obvious. You don't want to put a bad picture of the company towards the stakeholders. 
you want to put a better picture to stakeholder that's one of the reason particularly significant given current position of the company example seeking a new finance company seeking a new finance right that's the reason they don't want to put a note so possible reasons so what are possible reasons the company would not give a disclosure number one uh, directors don't want to put a bad image of the company in front of the stakeholders that's one reason and you stretch it into a paragraph and second uh, because the company uh, is in the process the company is in the process of negotiating further uh, loan from the bank so you don't want to put a bad picture to bank that you cannot pay the loan so that's one so possible reasons some of the possible reasons can be given in the case study right and some of the possible reasons can be thought journally so try to find the possible reason first given in the case study and then you can write a journal reason so why the directors may exclude disclosure two marks implication for the report if disclosures are not made evaluate the possible implication for the audit report if the disclosure is not made the uh, if the disclosure is not made the financial statements will not be presenting a true and fair view of the uh, true and fair view of the company if the disclosure is not made of the material uncertainties then what then the auditor needs to think about is it material is it material and pervasive our disclosure relating to going concern is pervasive because it because going concern is the basis on which financial statements are prepared such an important factor a disclosure relating to going concern is pervasive is material and pervasive because going concern is the basis on which the financial statements are prepared therefore if no disclosure is given if no disclosure is made it will lead down to an adverse opinion and the audit report will be modified due to an adverse opinion see i got my four marks and total six there were total six marks for the last part look at my six bullets my six bullets are giving me six marks you need to make a paragraph answer are you clear am i deviating from something i taught you yesterday on day four for reporting a disclosure of going concern is the only disclosure which is material and pervasive please note it down somewhere other disclosures like a related party disclosure or a contingent liability disclosure they are all material the going concern disclosure is the only material and pervasive disclosure because that is the basis of preparing the financial statement so it is pervasive it's affecting the whole financial statement if the if the disclosure is not given an adverse opinion if the disclosure is given then what will happen if the disclosure is given then what will happen tell me if the disclosure is given then what will happen murgc and will will murgc modify the report is is that a paragraph which modify the report yes very good so are you clear with the december 18 paper all of you the marking scheme for the c requirement are you clear with the marking scheme for the c requirement are you clear with the marking scheme of the b requirement the evidence in the working paper file are you clear what exactly the evidence is and what's the difference between an evidence and a procedure and are you clear with the marking scheme of the first part use the analytical procedure and evaluate the matters and please ensure wherever the examiner ask you to evaluate 
kindly give our conclusion. In the shortage of time in the webinar, uh, I cannot do that again and again. But again, I can reinforce that. I can simply reinforce that where examiner ask you to evaluate, please do give a conclusion at the end of that particular part in all questions in section B. If an evaluate, if, if examiner ask you to evaluate something in question number one, then you have to give a conclusion at the end of a briefing note. There is a difference, right? Because in the question number one, you're writing a briefing note. So you have to give a conclusion at the end, not in the middle, not after the requirement. But in the section B, if the, if the, if, if the examiner is asking you to evaluate in the question number 2A, you will give conclusion right after the 2A because you're not writing a briefing note, right? Is that clear between the two aspects, question number one and the other questions, all of you? Are you sound? Is, is this student note important to all of you? Okay, that's great, good. Okay, let's move out of this question. So please ensure that you're all practicing the going concern area and you're also uh, reading the article on the website, which is about going concern. Uh, when I share the day five resources with you, automatically that article will be shared. So these are the two questions on going concern. You will do this on your own. And this is what I have just uh, brainstormed with you, the, uh, the 18 one, right? And you know the updated marking scheme. And I'll be sharing the article with you when, I, when you get the day five resources. So off the going concern, right? Now into the next question. Now we have seen a question on matters to be communicated to those charged with governance a couple of time in the past papers, particularly I think the most recent instance where the examiner has asked you matters to be communicated to those charged with governance was in the June 19 paper, March, June 19 paper. And that's the most recent one. So I'll just take a look at this and just guide you how you should be preparing for a topic matters to be communicated to those charged with governance. Now just give me one minute if I can show you something uh, would be of relevance to you. Uh, I will be sharing this article with you as well if you have not yet read it because normally uh, the students uh, ignore uh, reading of the article which is uh, something very, very bad. You should read the article. Just give me one second. Okay, can you see the articles in front of you currently? Technical articles are coming in front of your screen. Please confirm that. Matters to be communicated to those charged with governance is what we are discussing. Uh, can you all see the articles in front of your screen in the browser? Thank you. You move down, syllabus area E, and in the syllabus area E, you find this article right here. Can you find this article here? Auditors report to those charged with governance. That is matters to be communicated to those charged with governance. How many of you have ever read this article, Metis Auditor Report? If you read this article, this article exactly tell you what sort of matters are to be communicated to TCWG. How many of you have read it? You have like 12 days, 13 days remaining before exams. Anyone who, anyone who says I've not read it yet, Is there any student to say, no, I've not read it? Okay, no one is saying no. So that means all of you have read it. Okay, no, no answers, good. So all of you have read this article. That's, that's extremely good. Okay, finally, one student has reacted with no. Another one saying no. So the no came quite late. 
Okay, so please ensure you read this article. I will be sharing this in the day five resources on the Google Drive, Auditor Report to Those Charged with Governance, a wonderful article which tells you about what sort of matters are communicated. See this list of matters. What sort of matters are communicated to those charged with governance? There is a list of them. Now, if you read these lists, you will be better off. Now, if I go back to my word, to my presentation, and we were looking at a topic, matters should be communicated to those charged with governance, which comes to the section B, syllabus area E, exam requirement on matters to be communicated to TCWG, and what you should know, and how to deal with a question on this. Okay, let's first look at the question. Uh, that's in the March, June 19 exams. Okay, can you see the March, June 19 exam in front of your screen now? Please confirm. Okay, that's great. Uh, if you can confirm the March, June 19 exam in front of your screen now. Okay, you scroll down and you come to the question number two, I guess. Okay, question number two. Okay, can you see the question number two? in front of you, section B. Now, the first part of the question number two is where we have a report, auditor report, typical question, examiner giving you an auditor report and then asking you to critically appraise the report. See this, critically appraise the report. We've done this discussion yesterday, critically appraise the report for 10 marks. So the question number two A is about critical appraisal of the report. So out of the 25 marks we have for a section B question, 10 marks have gone on a critical appraisal. And I was discussing this yesterday with you that a critical appraisal cannot be more than 10 marks. Now in the second part, the B requirement, I hope you can see the B requirement here, 2B. In the 2B requirement, examiner is asking you something here, right here. See this, 2B, control C, 2B. This is what we are discussing. And this came for 15 marks in a June 19 paper. And we'll see the examiner criticism for that as well. Let me take this to my support file. And we are starting a new topic now on the final day. Matters to be communicated to those charged with governance. Matters to be communicated to those charged with governance, right? That's what we are starting now as a new topic. Okay, let's start the discussion, all of you. Uh, question number 2B from the March, uh, June 19 exams. And let's copy the requirement. This is a requirement, right, of the paper. <clears throat> I hope you can see the requirement in front of your screen, all of you. Okay, let's read and understand. Required, from the information provided above, so that means from the information provided in the case study, comma, recommend. So you need to recommend the methods which should be included in the Eddy and company. Eddy and company is the audit firm, right? Audit firm. In the Eddy and company report to those charged with governance. So what sort of methods will you include in audit firm report, Eddy and company report? to those charged with governance. Now that's the realistic title of the examiner article, which I was just showing you. Look at this, auditor report to those charged with governance. And the question in the June 19 paper is saying, Eddie and company report to those charged with governance. And the examples taken in the case study of the June 19 is from the list here, is from the list here. Can you see this list in the blue? The examples taken are from the list in the blue here. So it's better that you read the article. I hope you got the reinforcement, all of you, and you will be reading this article soon in the next 24 hours. So from the information provided above in the case study, I recommend the matters which should be included in the Eddy and company report to those charged with governance. So do, do auditor write a report to TCWG at the completion stage of the audit and do auditor, uh, do auditor report significant matters during the audit to TCWG through this report? Yes. So 
what sort of matters will be included in eddy company report and explain the reason why they will be included explain the reason why they will be included so what sort of a matter will be included in the report and why can you see and here can you see the visible and here so examiner is asking you two things here right number one <clears throat> which matters will be included in the report to tcwg and why so which matter one mark and why one mark so total marks you have is 15 so how many total points you should have in your answer 15 marks divided by 1 is equal to 15 points in the total answer in the total answer so everything you write will give you one mark right so 15 marks divided by 1 is equal to 15 points in the total answer right so simple looking marking scheme just like a reporting question um, i think the syllabus area e uh, has the one marking one mark marking scheme except for going concern where every matter of a going concern is worth two marks is everyone clear with the question understanding are you sound with the question are you sound that you have to read the article on auditor report to tc wg please confirm that so what matters will be included in the eddy and company report to tc wg and explain the reason for that inclusion now listen to me for one minute and we'll just brush over the case study now the report to tcwg is at the completion stage of the audit number one when you're winding up the audit so all significant matters which has been identified during the course of the audit and all significant issues whether they are scope limitations whether they are internal control weaknesses whether they, there is a misstatement in the financial statement or uh, the management behavior was wrong, the management attitude was wrong, the management did not provide you the right information, etc. Whatever the issues are, or even the management offered you some gifts and hospitality, which you considered as a bribe, ethical issues all are included in a report to tcwg because this is this is a final list of issues which arose in the audit so in this report you include the ethical issues which arose in the audit uh, scope limitations management attitude management behavior misstatements in the financial statements internal control weaknesses and the list goes on please read the article is that clear to all of you are you clear when this report is written at what time of the audit and what is included in the report so it's a critical report right before you issue the audit report i hope you're all clear uh, all with me because i'm not getting any yes and no's from your site uh, since very long are you clear with what i discussed with you in the last five to seven minutes Okay, good. So can we just have an extract of uh, a suggested answer? Just one exercise. Let's do one quick exercise on a suggested answer so that you can write the rest of the answer yourself. Just give me one minute. Okay, exercise, suggested answer. Okay, from the information above, right? So we go to the information, uh, which is in the case study, right here. And we start reading it. Okay, uh, can you see the B requirement in front of your screen? Can we start reading it, all of you? Can you see the B requirement in front of your screen? Okay, that's great. So let's, let's start reading it, right? Your firm, Eddie, 
has asked your firm Eddie has asked you to perform an independent review of the working paper of Taylor, which is a listed entity. Oh, it's a listed entity. That's extremely important. And has been an audit client of your firm for last 10 years. The audit field work is almost complete. And as part of your review, you have been asked to advise the audit team on drafting of their report to those charged with governance. So you are a manager risk basically, right? And you need to advise the audit team on drafting of the report to those charged with governance. Taylor and Company is a discount food retailer, which operates 85 stores internationally, nationally, sorry. The financial statement for the year ended 30th of April, recognized revenue. Uh, revenue is to $47 million. We might need to calculate materialities. Wherever we calculate the materiality, we will get one mark for it. A profit before tax uh, is 146 million, sorry, 14.6 million. And then we have the total assets, which is 535 million. Okay, next paragraph. So far, that was just an introduction. No matter to be included. After a period of rapid expansion, uh, 2009 has been a year, uh, 2000, 20x9, sorry, has been an year in which Taylor Company has strengthened its existing position within the market and has not acquired any additional stores. The company's draft statement of financial position for 20X9 includes a property portfolio of a 315 million, all of which are legally owned by the company. So what is the total property portfolio? The total property portfolio is $315 million, which is quite significant. In the current year, the company has chosen to adopt a policy of revaluing its property portfolio. Okay, that's wonderfully fine. That's a right accounting policy. So they have adopted a policy of revaluing its property portfolio, which is 315 million for the first time. And this is reflected in the draft figures for 20X9. The audit work on property, plant and equipment included testing of a sample of revaluations. Eddie and company requested at the planning stage, the independent external valuation report should be made available to the audit team at the start of the final, at the start of the final audit. A number of these documents were not available when requested and it took three weeks for them to be received by the audit team. Do you believe this is the first issue here that the audit firm requested at the planning stage that the documents for the revaluation of the property should be made available to them. Firstly, they were not available. And then it took three weeks for the auditor to get them. Has, it, has this wasted a lot of time of the auditor? Has this uh, mean that the evidence provided by the management was not on a timely basis? And you know, this is the management responsibility, right? To provide every possible information to the auditor. So is, is, is this questioning the management responsibility? So do you believe this is the first issue here? Control C, this becomes the first issue. And I'll take it on my Word file and quickly write an answer for this. And let's see how many marks we get for it. That's the first one, sorry. Just uh, let me copy this again. It's not copied here. Just let me take it back to my Word file. Okay, we got it right here. I'll just complete the paragraph and then we'll come back writing the answer. This is the first issue, right? We got from the question. Let's go back and complete the paragraph. Next. The audit working paper also identify that on the review of the non-current asset register, there were four properties with a total carrying value of 11.1 million, which had not been revalued and we're still recorded at depreciated cost. When we revalue, should we revalue the entire class of asset? What was the entire class of asset? $315 million property portfolio. So should we revalue the entire property portfolio as per IS 16? Should we revalue the entire class of asset? Is, is this a wrong accounting treatment that four of the properties were not revalued and they are still held at cost? So is, is that an other issue which I should be communicating to the management? Control C. And next issue. And I take it to my Word file. 
my issue number two, right here. Now see, when I convert this to my answer out of the 15 marks, how many marks will I get here? Because the examiner is saying, first of all, you need to tell which matters will be included in the report and why. Now, this is the two areas I've taken from the examiner paper. So this is from the case study. Let's solve the answer quickly. Okay, when I'm writing the answer, matters to be included in report to TCWG. Suppose this is my answer in the exam paper. And how would I start writing the answer? I'll preferably give headings. I think the first matter is uh, external valuation reports be made available, but they were not made available. So I, I preferably put a heading external valuation report. So examiner knows which point am I writing external valuation reports. And I write under this. The auditor requested them at the planning stage, right? But uh, they were not being made available. And it uh, after when when requested, when requested, and it took three weeks for them to be received by the audit team. So that wasted a lot of time for them, right? So number one point, you are writing this, you are putting this matter in the report to those charged with governance. The matter uh, relating to uh, the late receiving of uh, the external valuer report the matter relating to the late receiving of the external value report should be included in the report to those charged with governance as the external valuer report is an external source of evidence to confirm the basis used in revaluation and is a source for the auditor to gather sufficient and appropriate evidence. So the matter relating to the late receiving of the external valuer report should be included in the report to TCWG why? As the external value or report is an external source of evidence to confirm the basis used in revaluation and is a source for the auditor to gather sufficient audit evidence. So the late receiving has affected all this. Further, the late receiving of evidence also questions also questions the management responsibility towards audit as the management is responsible to provide timely information to the auditor. The late receiving, the late receiving of the valuer report must had affected the timetable of the audit, must have affected the timetable of the audit, must had affected the timetable of the audit, full stop. So further, the late receiving of the evidence also questions the management responsibility towards the audit. And that is one of another reason why you're including it in the report. And the late receiving of the value report must have affected the time span of the audit as well. So one mark, one mark, two. This is how you're writing. You are justifying why this matter is important or you're justifying why this matter should be included in the report to fetch one and look at the heading. Now, everyone reading my answer knows this relates to the external valuation report. I hope you're clear with the answer. Let's write the last one. The last one relates with uh, four properties were not revalued. Four properties. Control C. Four properties. And I put my next heading. Four properties. 
four properties. So everyone knows what answer am I writing? You first tell the four properties with four properties having a carrying value of dollar 11.1 million is a fill in the blank percentage of the total assets is the fill in the blank percentage of the total assets because the carrying value is a balance sheet item uh, can you can you find me the percentage how much was the total assets of the company uh, the total assets of the company were 535 million 535 million is the total assets of the company so how much is the 11.1 million of 535 million can you find the answer 11.1 million divided by 535 million the total assets who will give me the answer 11.1 million divided by 535 million okay 2.1 percent thank you so much cost cost and salaya 2.1 percent okay let's move back to my word file is 2.1 percent is 2.1 percent thank you lucy 2.1 percent of the total assets thus <clears throat> material so every time i comment on material i fetch one mark straight away in the entire triple a paper four properties having a carrying value of 11.1 million is material to the total assets full of stop the uh the four properties uh, held at carrying value held at uh, historical cost held at depreciated historical cost depreciated historical cost and not revalued is a wrong accounting policy is a wrong accounting treatment is a wrong accounting treatment and this matter should be communicated to tcwg so that they are made aware of the wrong treatment and to ensure this treatment gets corrected. So why are you including it in a report to those charged with governance? Because this matter is a wrong treatment and you want the management to be aware of the wrong treatment so that the correction is made. Now, because you're saying it's a wrong treatment, you need to justify the right one. So you fetch more marks. Where, wherever in the AAA paper, you tell this is a wrong treatment, then straight away, whichever question you are attempting, you have to tell the right treatment. Next. When, when a class of asset is revalued as per the relevant standard, the entire class of asset should be revalued, should be revalued. So the entire property portfolio so the entire property portfolio should be revalued and the four properties the four properties should not be excluded from this revaluation so the four properties should not be excluded from this revaluation so you're putting up the right accounting treatment and for that right accounting treatment you will fetch another one mark. Lastly, you will be telling further the manage further this meta should be communicated to TCWG, not because it's a wrong accounting treatment, it's a wrong accounting treatment, but also it is a material misstatement as currently the uh, total assets of the company 
are understated because you have not revalued them. The four of them are understated. So that's, that's another reason, right? You need to communicate this to the management because currently it's not just the wrong accounting treatment. It's also a misstatement. So on four properties, you're almost taking like four marks. You had a bonus mark materiality. Then you had a bonus mark on the accounting treatment. Then you had a bonus mark that you need to communicate them to the management because of the wrong treatment. And finally, you are communicating because it's a material misstatement. Four marks from the property, two marks from the external valuation report, six out of the total 15 marks you have. So you still need to write another, um, uh, you still need to write another answer for nine marks, right? I hope you will continue writing the same way. I hope you got the track. So please ensure you read the article, uh, which is made available. Uh, auditors report to those charged with governance. Because if a question like such comes in exam paper, this is a bonus opportunity. Because from the case study, you need to identify the meta, which should be communicated to those charged with governance. And why? I hope this is not a difficult question, right? And you can gain marks here. So please ensure you read the article. Please ensure you solve the question March, June 19. So you are affirmatively clear on the subject matter. Is that clear to all of you? Can you move on to the last topic then? Evidence in the working paper file. Okay, thank you. Now the last thing and a quick discussion because we have, we discussed a bit of evidence uh, already. So it should not be taking more than 30 minutes here. Audit evidence. We know this is quite a repetitive area which comes in section B, uh, just like procedures mostly comes in the question number one or procedures mostly come in other, other assignments. Audit evidence, uh, syllabus area E, what the question on evidence expects from you now, what's so difficult in audit evidence? Uh, is evidence an opportunity to score marks and the marking scheme? Let's let's go down quickly, searching for the types of questions you get on evidence and are we thoroughly prepared for each one of them? Audit evidence. That's what we are starting now. <clears throat> and let's take a stretch on this topic and let's conclude it. Now, first of all, uh, you need to understand that when we look at the topic audit evidence, there is no examiner article on it, right? There is no article to read. But there are two types of questions which comes on audit evidence. And I normally refer them as type one and type two. You must have seen my previous webinars. And again, I'll justify uh, the type of questions. Uh, when you see the past papers. There are two types of questions which come on audit evidence. Let's take a look at the two types. Number one, type one, very common, very common. A question which asks you, let me show you that, uh, that came in the June 17 exam, if I remember, in, in other exams as well. But I, I just remember a June 17 instance. I hope you can see the June 17 paper in front of your screen. Uh, any paper which is uh, shown on screen will be shared on the Google Drive, so don't worry about it, uh, because this will not be available on the ACC website. June 17 paper, I hope you can all see that. Please confirm. Okay, thank you. You move down. Look at this question number four. Question number four on your screen of the June 17 exams. And look at the requirements. Three situations. One situation with regards to inventory, accounting treatment, impairment, accounting treatment, and warranty provision, accounting treatment. And examiner saying this.
let's take this back to my support file. And this is a type one question. I'm taking an example of the type one from June 17, question number four as an example, as an example. So wherever you find this question, it's known as a type one question, right? So once you understand this, you can do as many as you want. Okay, let, let's put the requirement here. This is what the question is asking for, right? Okay, let's, let's read the requirements quickly. The question is asking you, uh, comment on the matters. Have you seen this terminology in the session yesterday, reporting question, matters? Today, we were looking at the matters for going concern, but that was going concern matters. Over here, the question is saying, comment on the matters to be considered. The question is not telling you which matters, but the question is telling you, comment on the matters which should be considered, comma, straight away, comma. Which matters? Not going concern matters. Which matters? No idea. And there is a big and break of a question. Explain the evidence you should expect to find in the working paper file. Same like the going cons uh, the cash flow we saw today. Explain the evidence in the working paper file. That's what you know so far. Now, two things has been asked for. Number one, matters to be considered. And number two, evidence in the working paper file. Now you know a bit about it, right? Working paper file just from the session today. Now, two things. Now, when the examiner says matters to be considered, if it is a going concern question, examiner will say matters to be considered, which may cast doubt on the going concern status. You know, oh, this is the going concern matter. Or if you are accepting a new client, the examiner will say, evaluate the matters in deciding whether to accept Flynn company as a new client. So, you know, oh, the matters relating to accepting a new client. So examiner is very clear. But in a reporting question yesterday, day four, examiner was saying, comment, explain the matters and explain the matters which should be discussed with management in relation to each of the uncorrected misstatement and explain the impact on the audit report. So examiner is saying you need to discuss the matters in relation to each of the uncorrected misstatement. And I've given you the breakdown of that. Now over here, the question is asking you comment on the meta, comma, examiner is not telling which matters and explain the evidence. So when the matters are being asked, when the matters are being asked in a question on evidence, do you all assure this is a question on evidence after reading it? Are you all assured this is a question on evidence? So in a question on evidence, whenever the examiner asks you to comment on the matters, what is happening? What is happening in a question on evidence? In a question on evidence, when the examiner asks you to comment on the matters, what is exactly happening in the case study? What is exactly happening in the case study? Go back, see what's exactly happening in the case study. See what, what is happening. Inventory, IS2, impairment, IS36, warranty provision, IS37. What is exactly happening in the case study? Accounting issues accounting issues, agree, disagree. So what is the case study about when a question comes on evidence? When a question comes on evidence, the case study is about accounting issues. True, false. Right? So whenever, whenever the auditor is commenting on an accounting issue, what is the case? What is exactly happening in the case study? The case study consists of accounting issues. That is it. So now it's pretty simple. Whenever there is 
an accounting issue in the case and the examiner ask you to evaluate or comment on the matter the matters are as follow number 1 because it's an accounting issue so the very first matter will be to did to comment on materiality is it material or not because it's an accounting issue so you need to comment on the treatment as well what is right and what is wrong in the treatment comment on the treatment because it's a comment on the treatment so the next question is comment on the under and over statement so you need to comment on the misstatement what is the misstatement if it is a wrong accounting treatment, what is understated? What is overstated? What is the misstatement? That is basically the impact on financial statement, not the impact on the report, right? It is not a reporting question. That is it. That is it. So in a question on evidence, because the subject matter of a question on evidence will be an accounting issue and wherever accounting issue comes in a AAA paper, we discuss the materiality. We discuss the treatment. We discuss the under and over statement. Yes, if it is a reporting question, we also discuss the impact on opinion. That is something extra, right? So I hope you are clear with the breakup. You comment on the materiality, you get one mark. So each matter commented is worth one mark is that clear to all of you now listen to me very carefully something in a triple a paper whenever there is an accounting issue to work on just like a risk question, just like a risk question or an or a question on evidence or reporting. I think these are three areas, right, where you get uh, accounting issues. You do get accounting issues in a risk question. Uh, you do get accounting issues in a evidence question and you do get accounting issues in a reporting question, right? So in a AAA paper, whenever there is an accounting issue to work on, just like a risk question or a, or a question on reporting or an evidence, comma, the, the answer approach remains the same, except for in a reporting question, in a reporting question, the, uh, in a reporting question, an extra comment is done on impact on opinion and report that is something extra so for example just just let me uh, make a table here with four things just one minute let me make table with three things right suppose you have a question on audit risk or you have a question on risk of material misstatement, right? You have a question on audit evidence asking you to comment on the matters, or you have a question on reporting asking you to comment on matters, right? Now, in all three cases, in the reporting question, the matter is accounting. In an audit evidence question, the matter is accounting. And in an audit risk question or a ROM, most of the time what is happening in the case study is accounting, right? I agree, disagree. Most of the time when you read a question on audit risk or ROM, what is happening in most of the case study? Detection risk or accounting issues? Tell me, waiting for your answers.
So in all cases, what is happening here is an accounting issue, right? Thank you. Finally, got your answer. Much awaited answer. Okay, so accounting issues, right? So when you are writing an answer, whether for risk, whether for evidence and whether for reporting, everything remains the same. Uh, you comment on the materiality, you comment on the treatment, you comment on the under and over statement that is in the financial statement. And one thing extra, which is only done in a reporting question, third below, is the impact on the opinion and the report of the wrong accounting treatment, opinion or the report. So in an audit risk question, uh, you do comment on the materiality, right, if I'm not wrong. You do comment on the materiality, right? Just give me one second if I can find the, uh, just one second, sorry. Uh, Okay, I hope you can see it, right? The tick mark. So you comment on the materiality, right? In, uh, in a question on uh, audit risk materiality. You, the same you do is you do it on an evidence question. You do it in the reporting question. Treatment in a risk question, treatment in an evidence question, treatment in a reporting question. One, one mark. Under an overstatement, because that's the risk of material misstatement. In an audit evidence question, you still tell the under and overstatement. Uh, and in a reporting question, you still tell what is the under and overstatement. But one thing extra you do in a reporting question, which you don't do in an evidence question and a risk question is uh, because of an under and overstatement, what is the impact on the opinion and the report? That's an extra thing, which you're not doing currently in these two areas. I hope this table gives you a clear picture that whenever, wherever in the AAA paper, you are writing an accounting issue, whether you're writing an accounting issue in a risk question or in an evidence question or in a reporting question, everything remains the same how you write an answer, except for in a reporting question, you do one thing extra, that is the impact on opinion and the audit report. Are you clear with it? Are you all clear? Is this table beneficial? Is this table beneficial to all of you? Okay, thank you so much. So that is one important student note, which is to be taken from the session today. So one mark for materiality, one mark for treatment, one mark for under and overstatement, and one mark for opinion and report. That's how the structure goes in. So is everyone clear with comment on the matters to be considered? Is that something pretty simple? You must have done multiple times in your preparation for AAA whether in the risk question or in the reporting question. So you don't need to do the same in evidence. Okay, the next thing is explain the evidence in the file. Have I clear, clear, cleared you on evidence? Notes of, copy of, extracts of? I hope you're clear on that. I'm not wasting further time here, right? Just one last thing, evidence in working paper file is equal to what? CWSP just discussed above just discussed above. I hope you're clear on that, right? Is that clear? Should we move on to the type two question? Are you all sound clear with the type one question? Right, one, one mark per evidence. Clear? Good, thank you. Moving to the next and the last question, type two. When you look at the type two question on, uh, the evidence that's a bit different, right? Type two, question type two. Now, when you look at the type two, I think the type two came in December 16 uh, or March 20, March 20, as an example. Uh, let me show you the March 20 paper in front of your screen. March 20 paper, okay. Can you see the March 20 paper in front of your screen? Please confirm that, all of you.
Okay, thank you. You go down, March 20 paper, question number two. Right, question number two, can you all see this question two in front of your screen? Okay, that's good enough. And you go down in the question number two, you have so many situations about fraud, about development cost, about trade receivables, and you come down looking at the requirement. Look at the requirement 2A. The 2A is not to be done because 2A relates with fraud. We are not discussing that topic. 2A is about the implication of fraud and actions to be taken. But look at the, this requirement here, this one. Control C, highlight it, and taken back to my Word file. March 20, question number 2A and 2A2 and 2A3. 2A2 and 2A3. That's what we're looking for, paste. I hope you can see that in, in front of your, uh, of your screens now. Okay, in respect of the development cost, one area, and in respect of the trade receivable, second area, which is given in the case study, comment, not on the matters, not on the matters, comment on the sufficiency and appropriateness of the evidence obtained. In respect of the development cost and trade receivable, is a question asking you to comment on the matters? Will you write the answer materiality accounting treatment under an overstatement? statement? No, absolutely wrong answer. The question is asking you to comment on the sufficient. I think the student is so much obsessed that whenever a question comes on evidence, the examiner will ask you comment on the matters, which is materiality treatment under an overstatement. No. What if you get a question like this? Don't just look at the word evidence in exam paper. Don't just look at the word evidence in the exam paper and say, okay, materiality treatment and under an overstatement. No. Is the examiner asking that? Examiner is asking you to comment. Comment on what? Comment on the sufficiency of the evidence obtained. Now, listen very carefully. In the case, the examiner will tell you what evidence has been gathered by the team on development cost and receivables. So examiner will exactly tell you what evidence has been gathered by the team on the two areas. You need to judge, is the evidence sufficient and appropriate or not? If it is not, if it is not, then you need to tell why it is not and why it is not. And sorry, why it is not and recommend further evidence that should be gathered. So if you say the evidence gathered by the team is not sufficient, then you need to tell then what should have been done. Look at the second part of the question. The second part of the question asks you recommend the actions to be taken by the auditor and including, including further evidence that should be obtained, further evidence that should be obtained. So if you say that the evidence gathered on receivable is insufficient, then you need to recommend further evidence that should be gathered. I hope you're getting my point. So if you say that the evidence is insufficient, why? And then what further should be done? So if the evidence is insufficient, why? And what extra to be done? Is that clear? Are you clear with the breakup here? Each comment is one mark and each further evidence, each further evidence is one mark. So that is simple. Now, for example, if I can just demonstrate that quickly, uh, I take you back to the trade receivable, for example. Okay, can you see the trade receivable or a trade receivable in front of your screen? Right here, control C, 
I take it back to my Word file. I copy it over here, trade receivable, and will write an answer so that you are very sure, okay, this is how we write actions, this is how we write evidence, this is how we write uh, comment on the sufficiency, right? And I hope you will be happy with that uh, of, of the efforts I'm doing uh, to write this answer just for you so that you get benefit just a few days before exam paper. Are you clear with this trade receivable on your screen? I'm just giving you one, uh, I'm giving you two minutes. Can you just read this information so we can write an answer? Uh, while you're reading trade receivable on your screen, think about whether the evidence gathered is sufficient and appropriate or not. And think about what further evidence will you be gathering in this place? I'm giving you two minutes, start reading now. And once you are done with reading, please put in the chat box, done. I'm waiting for your answers. Start reading now. Okay, thank you, Abhishek, for confirming you have read it. Okay, waiting for some of the other students to confirm that they have read reading the paragraph on trade receivable in front of the screen. Okay, done too. Thank you so much. Constance. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So what two things we have to do for trade receivable? Uh, we have to comment on the sufficiency and appropriateness. And we need to write actions or further evidence, right? So we are not bifurcating this is action, this is further evidence. Rather, we just make one list. Uh, which has actions and further evidence where possible. Not necessarily in every situation you have an action, but further evidence is must. How many marks we have for trade receivables? Uh, let me confirm that from the question paper quickly. Uh, the number of marks we have for trade receivable. Okay, in total, we have 11 marks, right? So it's, it's up to us how, much, how many marks we consume on one and the other. So... Uh, it's up to you, right? You can keep more marks for development cost and less for trade receivable or vice versa. In total, we have 11 marks uh, for development cost and receivable. So you can, you can keep six for one and five for other and the vice versa. Okay, let's go down. Comment on the sufficiency. Trade receivable recognized in the group current assets includes a balance of $500,000 relating to a specific customer, Hemelin. Audit procedures indicate that at the 31st of December, the balance was more than six months overdue for payment. So you all, you identified that, which is wonderful. So your procedures did identify that the balance is six months overdue. So that means your procedure so far is good. In relation to this balance, which is a very important balance, which sounds like a bad debt, the following procedures have been performed. Number one, agreement of the balance, which is $500,000, to the invoices and the original customer order. So we agree the $500,000 to the invoice issue, and we agree the $500,000 to the order. Now tell me, because it's an outstanding balance of a $500,000, as an auditor, should we subsequently check during audit that whether any payment has been received against it or not? We, we confirmed on 31st of December, that is the year end of the company, that the balance was more than six months overdue. 
So while we are auditing the company in January and February, because audit is done after the year end. So should we confirm in the month of January and February subsequent to the year end that whether any payment has been received or not, rather than just checking it back to the old invoices and old orders? Do we normally check payments subsequently? Yes or no? Do we subsequently check payments of outstanding receivables subsequent to the year end in the bank statements? Obviously in the bank statement, Mustafa, where, where else would we check it from? So do we subsequently check receivables post year end? So have we done that? No. So is that is that first evidence I can write here? Number one in my list. Uh, I'm writing the evidence, right? So subsequent uh, copy of uh, the subsequent to subsequent bank statements, copy of the subsequent bank statements to confirm whether the payment from uh, Hemelin company um, has been received post year end or not, right? not review the bank statement copy of the copy of the subsequent bank statements to confirm whether the payment from Hamelin company has been received post year end or not copy of the bank statement i'm writing the evidence right please assure otherwise i would have said review the bank statement so i agree the balance to invoices but that's historical i am currently concerned about the bad debt of 500000 i'm currently concerned about whether 500000 dollar will be paid or not so I should look into the future and look whether the payment has been received in future or not. Next, discussion with the group credit controller who states that we are in discussion with Hemelin and we are confident that the payment will be made to us. We have always allowed the customer extended credit terms and they have eventually paid us. So he's so optimistic. And obviously the group financial controller will always be optimistic because he's part of the management. And the management is the one who is involved in the window dressing of the financial statement. Quite possible that you're not writing this balance off because you want to overstate the receivables and you want to overstate the profit. So look, look at the optimism, right? Look at the optimism, which has been reflected by the statement of the, finan of the group credit controller. He says we allowed him extra credit always and he always pay on times. He always pay. And we're confident this time as well, he will pay. Full stop. So... We just had two things. We just had an agreement of the historical invoices and we just had a discussion. So uh, have, we, have we seen subsequent payments? No. Have we uh, discussed with management any possibilities of recording bad debts? Have we discussed with management a need to write off this balance? No. We just had a discussion where the group financial controller is very optimistic that the payment will be made. Yes, the, the age analysis even, right? The age analysis is, is also a fine document to be, uh, to be taken into context here. So the last thing, Hamelin company was included in the trade receivable direct confirmation audit procedure. So you send the direct confirmation to Hamelin, whereby a sample of customer were asked to confirm the balance, but no reply was received. Did we receive any reply from Hamelin? When we send... So if you don't receive a reply from the debtor, do you send him a reminder? Do you send him a reminder? So my further evidence, reminder letter, reminder letter sent to Hamelin company. Reminder letter sent to Hamelin company to assure that the customer do reply on the outstanding balance. The customer do reply on the outstanding balance to confirm existence of the customer. That, why didn't I wrote copy of the reminder letter? Why did, why did I just wrote copy uh, reminder letter sent to the Hamelin company as an evidence in my file? Why, why didn't I wrote a copy of the uh, reminder letter? I write copy with a document of the management. I don't write copy with something which belongs to me as an auditor. Confirmation letter is my document. It's my, my document as an auditor, right? So if something is like my document, 
I will never write the word copy with it, right? So confirmation letter is not a management document. Confirmation is my document. No, reminder is not sent by the client, right? Reminder is sent by the auditor. The, the, the client only facilitates you in the postal process, right? It is your responsibility as an auditor, right? Mustafa, to send a reminder letter. But the postal process is done by the management. Yes, the auditor is the send, uh, one who sends the confirmation. Lucy, agree. I hope Mustafa, you're clear as well. Lucy has given the right answer. Okay, back. So copy of the subsequent bank statement and not a copy, just directly a reminder letter to assure that the customer do reply. So I must, I must have sent a reminder letter, which I have not. So further evidence will include a reminder letter, right? Yes, that is also a very good uh, answer from you, uh, Constance. Constance is saying, what about checking previous correspondence with the client since the balance is six months old? Yes, is, if there's any correspondence between the group financial controller and Hemelin, you can have a copy of that to confirm uh, the willingness of Hemelin to pay. So you can, you can have that as well, that's good. So you, you can have a copy of uh, any correspondence between uh, the group financial, between the group con credit controller between the group credit controller and the and Hemelin to confirm uh, any possibilities by when the amount will be received, right? So that's just one good point coming from a student constance in the session. Good, thank you. So three evidences. Now let's comment on the sufficiency of the evidence, right? I, I believe the evidence gathered is insufficient because of several reasons. Uh, the evidence gathered by the audit team on receivable uh, is insufficient in several instances, in several instances, uh, as follow in several instances as follow number one okay the evidence gathered by the audit team on receivable is insufficient in several instances as follow number one uh, the outstanding receivable was uh, only checked to prior invoices and order and no efforts were made no efforts were made to check whether any payment has been received from the customer subsequent to the year end so that's that's one reason why the evidence was insufficient and for this we wrote the first evidence second the evidence gathered is insufficient in several instances as follow the uh the uh no discussion no discussion has been made with the group finance with the group credit controller on the need for bad debts for the need for bad debts or uh, or writing of the balance or writing of the balance as it's uh, long overdue no discussion has been made with the group credit controller on the need for the bad debt writing of the balance as it's long overdue. Rather, the only discussion was on the stance of the controller. The only discussion was on the stance of the controller. So you, you only discussed the stance of the controller that he's very happy things will be recovered. You didn't informed controller that as an auditor, I'm very skeptical about the recovery of this $500,000. And being skeptical, 
I want this to be written off. You didn't have any discussion on that. And lastly, it's insufficient because uh, the uh, even when no reply, even when no reply was received from the customer, even when no reply was received from the customer, the audit team didn't bothered about sending a reminder letter to generate a reply from the customer. So the evidence gathered was insufficient because of the three reasons. The first reason, the second reason, and the third reason. I get one mark for telling why it's insufficient. Second mark, why it is insufficient. Third marks, why it is insufficient. Then for every insufficiency, I wrote a further evidence. For the first inefficiency, I should have a subsequent bank statement. I should send a reminder letter. I should review correspondence between the company and Hebelin, or I should have notes of discussion with the controller about the possibility of writing it as a bad debt. Notes of discussion. Or I can write an action. Action can come with the, with the uh, verb, right? Action, action. So action can be discuss with the group financial controller. So I don't need to write notes of discussion because I'm taking an action. Action comes with verb. Discuss with group financial controller the need to uh, recognize an allowance for bad debts on the outstanding balance on the outstanding balance from Hamelin company. So when you're writing an action, you can directly write it with an action, discuss. So your list contains action and evidence together. You're not bifurcating them for examiner. This is action, this is evidence. Examiner will pick himself, right? Copy is an evidence. Sorry, copy is an evidence. Again, reminder letter is uh, evidence. Then copy is an evidence. Then discuss is an action. So we almost got four marks here, four and three above seven out of 11 marks. We got seven here, but I hope you're getting the track of writing comment on the sufficiency actions and further evidences. Is everyone clear with this? Are you fine with this exercise, the marking scheme and everything in the type two question? So you should be aware of the type two question, which is extremely important and you should understand the requirement. I hope you're clear, all of you. Now, just before I wrap up things today, uh, I'll just take a 10 minutes of recap on day five, the final day of this webinar. And uh, you need to listen to me very carefully for the next 10 minutes before I end the session. Now, first of all, over the last five days, uh, considering the limitation uh, that this is a webinar and this is not regular classes and the limitations that we have a time zone, uh, we have a number of hours in which everything is to be fit up. And then again, the limitation that you need to decide what you will deliver uh, against the previous webinars I have conducted as a tutor. So whatever the agenda was of this webinar, uh, the cut short story is that over the last five days, you must have learned something out. Number one, you must got to know some uh, incremental things which you had no idea of. You must have got to know something uh, special, something important uh, of which you had no idea before. Or you must have got to evaluate your weaknesses if you were repeating the AAA paper or you are repeating the AAA paper. And, it, and, and the list goes on. So I think over the last five days, if you sit down today after the webinar comes to an end and you analyze what exactly have you gained from the last five days? 
and try to reinforce that, try to implement that on the day of exam. Now, I believe the most critical thing of the last five days is the reading and understanding of the requirement. If a student do understand what the question is asking with all the comma and and with all the expectations, because one requirement with a comma and an and contains multiple expectations of the examiner, just like the last question we were doing, it was not only asking you to comment on the sufficiency and appropriateness of the evidence, but was also asking for actions and evidences. Three things. So you need to give a complete answer to the examiner. But if you are reading a requirement in a hurry or you overlook a comma and an and, eventually you are giving an incomplete answer to the examiner and you will never pass the AAA paper. So I, I believe this is one of the major uh, gain from the webinar that you must have understood how important is it to understand and read the requirement before you attack the answer. Number two, reading the case study. Your answer should sync with the case study. The more you absorb the case study, the more you absorb the case study in your answer, the more you uh, link the case study with your answer, you try using the terminologies of the case study in your answer. You try picking things from the case study in your answer. The better the answer looks like. There is no rote learning right in the AAA paper. You cannot just have a rote learning. Even we saw in the previous days that the examiner was very critical of the student rote learning the procedures on a PFI, prospective financial information, and writing them more than the specific procedures. So it's about specific writing. It's about writing, linking the case study, syncing the case study. I hope you must have learned some mnemonics out like C, W, S, P, and C, A, S, P, et cetera, which is like um, something which uh, facilitate a student when you're writing a procedure and an evidence and the marking schemes. Because if you're unaware of the marking schemes, either you're writing too less or you're writing too more. And the last thing, you need to come out of the myth or misconception of the examiner answers. Examiner answers, you should read them. They're not, they're not a bad document. They're a wonderful document. But when you're reading them, just underline the point. Okay, this is the point the examiner wrote. This is the examiner comment on the sufficiency of the evidence. This is the point. Now, how he developed the point, how he explained the point. Now, when you explain a point, when I explain a point, when another student explain a point, will all three of us have a different explanation of a same point. So my point can match with your point, but my explanation can never match with your explanation. And that is the beauty of a theoretical paper. In a theoretical paper, the point should match, not the explanation. So if I look at the marking scheme of the examiner, an examiner wants me to write nine procedures, right? And the mark, examiner will write not nine procedures for nine marks. Examiner will write 18 procedures for nine marks. And you will say, oh, I have to write 18 procedures for nine marks. Absolutely wrong. Examiner tells a marking scheme for a procedure is one mark per procedure. So examiner writes more, right? Because he wants to guide you. It's, it's, not, it's not a three hour, 15 minutes answer. It's a tutorial gu guidance. So examiner will write uh, instead of five, 10. For five marks, examiner will not write five points. Examiner will write 10 points. Because he's got, he, the, team, the examining team is guiding you, right? So come out of that myth. Now, my point is that suppose you need to write nine procedures for nine marks and you, you wrote your nine procedures, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
And then you go and check the examiner answer. And in the examiner answer, if the nine procedures you wrote, you found four of them, five of them written by the examiner even. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I believe even if you reconcile 50%, even if you reconcile 50% with examiner, that's good. That's excellent. You can be a place winner if you reconcile 50%. Honestly, not more than that. Not more than that. So the myth to live with an examiner answer, to the myth of getting fantasized with the examiner answer, oh, such a big answer, such a beautiful answer. You cannot write that such a big and beautiful answer because examiner didn't wrote that in three hours and 15 minutes. That is a tutorial guidance which has been developed over time, which has not been developed in three hours and 15 minutes. Are you clear with it? Right. Please put this question, Mustafa, in the WhatsApp group to me directly personal. I will be responding to it. But listen to my conclusions here, which is more important currently. So uh, come out of the myth of fantasizing the examiner answer. I hope you will come out. You, you can learn from examiner answer. You can pick things from examiner answer, but not, oh, such big, oh, that long. Okay, for five marks, 10 points. Okay, for 24 marks audit risk. Oh, examiner wrote 24 audit risk for a 24 marks answer. I'll write the same. No, you cannot write 24 um, uh, audit risk for a 24 marks answer. You know the marking schemes. So I hope you're clear on that. So you need to ensure that the point you wrote agree with the point of the examiner, but the way you explained a point the length of your point will never match with the examiner. And even your explanation will never match the examiner because that's the beauty. That's the beauty of a theoretical paper. It's, it's not a numerical paper where two plus two is equal to four. It is not a numerical paper. And that's the reason the passing rates of numerical papers are better than theoretical papers because there is a greater subjectivity in a theoretical paper. So I hope you learn what you got in the last five days. You reinforce and you you are alert in the exam hall. Don't get panicked, stressed out. Be determined, be focused. Look at the screen in front of your uh, computer. See what the question is asking you. Don't get panicked. Aim, aim for completing 90% of the paper. If you complete 90% of the paper, you're wonderful, good, excellent student. And remember, not everything in the question paper you will be knowing. There might be five to 10 marks, which is like a big stress for you. Or you say, oh, I've never seen a question like such before. There are some exam settings like such, not every. So if there is something like five to 10 marks, which you think, oh, I have never seen it. And it, it goes off your mind. Leave it, ignore it. For a 10 marks requirement, which you don't know, are you spoiling 90% of your paper? Tell me. If you don't know 10%, minus it, ignore it, leave it, put it, in a uh, put it in a trash bin and look at the 90% of the paper. Focus on the 90% of the paper. Attack the 90% of the paper and get 50% get marks out of 90. You can do it. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. You can do it. Start believing in yourself. Be optimistic. Be optimistic, right? Look at the broader things, look at the broader things, not the minor things. Aim at the opportunities, look at the opportunities, grab the opportunities you have in the paper. So many times you're not grabbing the opportunities. Simple marks, easy marks. So I hope uh, I'm winding up, wishing you a very best of luck. Uh, I hope this, uh, this series of webinars must have helped you, benefited you. And as a tutor, I can only pray for you, right? I, I, my best wishes are with you. And I wish you all the very best of luck for your upcoming exams and wish you all success in your upcoming exams in June 22. And I hope you benefited from these webinars and um, all the best. Study effectively. You still have like under two weeks from now. And please ensure uh, that you utilize each of them carefully. So this is your tutor, Kashif Kamran, signing off from the fifth and the final day 
of the webinar to success for June 22 exams and wish you very best of luck. Take care, study effectively, have a nice day ahead. I'll be sharing the recording and the Google Drive uh, for all the five days uh, shortly as the recording gets uploaded. Take care, goodbye, and Allah Hafiz, all of you.